Well, let me begin by just making this statement. How many know life isn't fair? Life isn't fair. How many of you, as a parent, how many have had your kids say that to you? That's not fair. Right? I mean, you, you've said that before. That's not fair. Life isn't fair. Life isn't fair. And today, as we continue our series in the book of Daniel, we're calling this series Unshakable. When conviction and culture collide, we're going to see that Daniel is placed in a situation once again and treated very unfairly. Life is not fair. Life is not fair. In fact, when I used to say that as a kid, my mom would always tell me, you're right, life isn't fair. <laughs> Get used to it. Life isn't fair. <laughs> oh, I heard about two men. They were in the waiting room and both of their wives were getting ready. Uh, they were expecting fathers. Both of their wives were getting ready to give birth. And uh, the nurse came out and she said to one of them, congratulations, you have a brand new baby girl. To which the other man responded, hey, that's not fair. I was here first. Right? I mean, it doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't work like, like that, that life is not always fair. But sometimes people kind of can't, can't get used to the idea. We grow weary of that idea. We don't understand that idea. We think that life should be fair. We think that if you do good things, that good things ought to happen to you. If you obey the rules and you do good things and you work hard, then good things ought to happen. And if you do bad things and, and, and you don't follow the rules, and you do, then consequences ought to follow. Kind of this cosmic karma kind of thing, right? But how many of your life doesn't work like that? It doesn't work like that. Sometimes you can do good things and, and have terrible situations and circumstances and unfair things happen. And sometimes you can do terrible things and seem to get away with it. And we see people all the time who live in such a way. And you look and you go, why do they seem to always get blessed? I don't understand. I'm trying to do everything right. And it's not happening. Right? Life is not fair. Now, I want to tell you that God will eventually bring fairness. He will eventually uh, uh, bring, bring the sense of fairness to life. Uh, but that's not happening now. But one day in eternity, God will do that because he's a just God. But we see a picture of this idea of life not being fair and God acting in the life of Daniel. So we're back in Daniel chapter 6. We started last week in Daniel chapter 6. We just did the first 10 verses. And we focused on the faithfulness of Daniel. That Daniel was faithful. And we gave a little bit of background. And you understand that, that uh, Daniel was one of the exiles who had been taken captive out of Jerusalem. And, uh, and, and he was brought into the Babylonian empire under Nebuchadnezzar. And he was about 15, 16 at the time, somewhere in there, 14, 15, 16. He was a young teenager along with his buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, Azaria, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that was under Nebuchadnezzar, but time has passed. In fact, almost 70 years has passed. And in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is about 85 years of age. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire have come and gone. And a new empire has taken over the Medo-Persian Empire. And they have in power a guy by the name of Darius. And Darius has seen the faithfulness of Daniel, and he recognized some things in Daniel. And so when there was a transition of power in the kingdom, he said, I want Daniel to be one of three that I'm going to set up as administrators and have 120 satraps answer to these three administrators. And Daniel distinguished himself, Scripture says, above the others, and Darius was getting ready to promote him once again. And we've seen this over and over again in Daniel's life. Why? Because Daniel was faithful. Daniel for 85 years has been faithful consistently. And we talked about that last week. And Daniel had, been, had not only been faithful consistently, but he had been faithful professionally. He was very good in his job. Daniel was faithful under any kind of scrutiny. Scripture says that they couldn't find anything. He was very trustworthy. Daniel 6.4 says they could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy, neither corrupt nor negligent. There was nothing in Daniel's life that they could find under scrutiny, but he was also faithful spiritually. He was faithful spiritually. He was squeaky clean. He had been faithful to God. But the truth is, is that even though you are faithful to God, it doesn't, it doesn't prevent you from experiencing difficulty. 
It doesn't, it doesn't prevent us from, from going through difficult times. You can be faithful to the Lord, but it doesn't prevent the difficulty that can come. And today I want to just look at the rest of Daniel chapter 6. And as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you about three things you can count on as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. You can count on these three things if you're a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. The first is this, persecution and trouble are inevitable. Persecution and trouble are inevitable. Daniel's colleagues, as we talked about last week, became very jealous. They were jealous that, that Daniel had been faithful and that, that he had been promoted. He was in exile. They even say that. He was in exile. He wasn't, even, he wasn't even one of them. He wasn't a part of their culture. He was an outsider. And yet D Darius and others promote him above all of them. How could he get the promotion? And they were jealous of Daniel. And when they couldn't find any way professionally, any way in his conduct, any in the way, any of the ways he did business, when they couldn't find any other way to discredit him, they began to persecute him in regards to his faith. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 5. Finally, these men said, We will never find any basis of charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Friends, that's persecution. Persecution is when the law of God, what you believe spiritually, you begin to get targeted because of what you believe spiritually. That's persecution. They devised a scheme that was not, uh, uh, not to target anybody else except Daniel. It was devised specifically against Daniel. And as we shared last week, they knew that Daniel was a man of faith. In fact, not only did they know he was a man of faith because he, was, he had a good witness. He had been faithful consistently, but he had also been faithful spiritually. And they, they knew that. And they knew that Daniel had a regular pattern and habit of prayer. That three times a day, Daniel would open up the windows of his home towards Jerusalem and he would get down and he would begin to pray. Why? Because there was a prophecy that had come through Jeremiah the prophet that had said that because of Israel's sin against God, God's punishment was coming and that they were going to be punished for 70 years and taken into captivity. Daniel for those 70 years had opened up the windows and called upon God in his mercy for 70 years saying, God, we're holding to your promise and we're trusting that you're going to restore Jerusalem and you're going to restore the kingdom. You're going to restore those things back to us and I trust you. And three times a day, Daniel had been faithful and had a regular habit of prayer and they knew it. And because of his faithfulness, spiritually, they targeted him. They targeted him. Friends, when we are faithful spiritually, I'm going to tell you that there are people in our world that do not like what the Bible has to say or the way in which believers are called to live. How many know we're called to be holy? Do you know what holy means? Separate. We're called to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Holy means separate. Come out from among them. When you and I live differently than the culture around us, it brings persecution. It brings heat. There, there are problems that come. And so because they knew that, that Daniel had a regular habit of prayer, look at verse 7. The royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, the advisors, and the governors have all agreed that the king, talking about Darius, should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. The trap was set. The trap was set. What would Daniel do now? Would Daniel remain faithful to his God? Would he continue to pray or would they get him and he would say, you know what? I just won't pray for 30 days. The trap had been set. The target was Daniel. They wanted him out and they wanted him dead. 
He was either going to get out, they were either going to find something in which they could get him to stop being faithful to his God, some way in which they could create a scenario where Daniel would not have integrity and be faithful and true, something to trip him up, or if he remained faithful to his God and continued to pray, then he could be dead. Either way, they would have him. They were setting a trap. This isn't fair. It isn't fair. Come on, God, this isn't fair. God, why are you doing? Daniel has been faithful for 85 years. Is this how you treat people who are faithful to you? This isn't fair. But as we saw last week, Daniel remained faithful spiritually. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows, where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. And the key here is just as he had done before. This wasn't an act of rebellion against the king. This was Daniel remaining faithful to his God. He was remaining faithful to his God, steadfast and faithful. He knew that they were targeting him. He knew they were targeting him. But he resigned himself to the fact that regardless, he was going to serve the Lord. He was going to serve the Lord. He kept his prayer life consistent. And he was willing to face whatever consequences would come. He counted the cost. And sure enough, Daniel 6.11 tells us that these men were watching Daniel as he went into prayer. In fact, some commentators that I read on this believe that all of this happened in the same day. That early in the morning, they had gone to the king with their whole group and said, that, that make this decree, sign it in, that nobody should pray. And they went and they watched Daniel. And that day, Daniel went to pray. And he prayed in the morning. And he prayed at noon. And he prayed at, at the dinner hour in the evening. And they went back to the king and they said, aha, we got him now. We got him. In fact, verse 12, so they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human except you, right? Your majesty would be thrown in the lion's den. Darius seems to be unaware that they have been targeting Daniel with this. Somehow Darius seems to be the one who doesn't have a clue because look at his response. The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So Darius is not realizing they're referring to Daniel. He, he doesn't seem to have a clue. He likes Daniel, but he doesn't, he doesn't have a clue. And so he answers them, yes, I said it can't be repealed. Yes, I put this law into practice. The trap has been set. And without realizing it, not only does is Daniel seem to be trapped, but really Darius is trapped. Darius walks right into the trap. Daniel 6, 13 and 14 tell us this. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles, that's what I was referring to earlier, they're targeting him because he wasn't a part of their culture. He's an outsider. He's one of the exiles that were brought in. He's one of these exiles from Judah. He pays no attention to you. Look how they twist things, your majesty, to the one decree you put in, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when the king heard this, look, this is how I know that he didn't have a clue. (laughs) He was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. There it is. The reason why they went to the king, the reason why they asked for this law in the first place was to target Daniel, to get him out of the way. And now Darius finally realizes the plan and that he's fallen for it and he's been trapped and he knows that Daniel is innocent and he knows this isn't right. They know that that he wants to get rid of them. He knows this isn't fair. And so he goes to task to try to make every effort and find a loophole. Find a way around to be able to rescue Daniel. Surely with Darius being the ruler, right? There was some kind of a way that Darius, the ruler, could set Daniel free. But Daniel 6, 15 and 16 says Daniel's fate. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and they threw him in the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. I want to point out a few things. 
Point a few, few things that we need to understand. You know, we if you if you grew up with the flannel boards and that kind of stuff in Sunday school, and you know this story, you know from beginning to anybody like the flannel boards and all that. I've said that before. You know, if you if you had this story before, you know you know where this goes. You know the end. So sometimes we read it with knowing the end. We kind of have an ending bias. But I've got to tell you, in the moment, Daniel Daniel didn't know the end. Daniel didn't know if if God was going to deliver and rescue him. And Darius didn't know if if Daniel would be rescued. In the end, they didn't know that story. In the moment, they're making decisions not knowing the end. So a couple of things I want to point out. Persecution and trouble are inevitable for every believer, as I said. Persecution and trouble, they're inevitable for every believer. Daniel was faced with persecution by being faithful and doing what was right. He had a choice to make. I'm going to obey God or I'm going to obey this unfair targeted law of the land, this persecution. I'm I'm going to do that. What am I going to do? He had a choice to make. And when it came to whether it was going to be obedience to God or compromising his faith, Daniel chose obedience to God. But the result of that was the consequences, which is persecution. Yet even in obeying the Lord, again, God did not spare Daniel from the lion's den. Friends, I want you to know that when you are faithful and obedient to God, it doesn't mean that God is going to spare you from the trial, from the pain, from the consequences, from the trouble that comes from persecution. Sometimes we got to face the pit of lions like we talked about with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sometimes you got to go through the fire. God doesn't always deliver you from it. Sometimes you got to face it and go through it. Daniel had to experience the lion's den. He had to go the experience of the lion's den. Remember what David wrote, Psalm 23. We love the 23rd song, don't, don't we? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in one. Right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He quiets my soul. Man, we love those things, right? Anoints my head, right, with oil. But what about this in verse 4? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk. Though I walk through what? I got to walk through it. I got to walk through it. Through what? Through the valley of the shadow of death. I got to walk through it. There are times in our lives, friends, where we got to walk through it. There are times through our lives where persecution and trouble come. And God isn't delivering us from it. But he says you got to walk through it. But I will be with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not fear. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. Sometimes we got to go through it. Persecution and trouble is inevitable. John 16, Jesus said this, in this world you will have trouble. But that's not fair. It's not fair. It's also not fair that Jesus Christ had to die on the cross for our sins. Sometimes we need to thank God for his unfairness. Persecution is inevitable. Friends, sometimes we're going to have to go through life and we're going to get some battle scars. There's going to be some wounds. There's going to be some persecution. That's a part of being part of the kingdom of light. Out of the kingdom of darkness, we are called. We used to be a part of the kingdom of darkness, but now we're a part of the kingdom of light. Friends, when darkness and light clash, let me tell you something. Trouble comes. Persecution comes. There's a little bit of fireworks that come. In fact, Paul put it this way, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will, will suffer persecution. Will suffer persecution. Trouble and persecution, friends, are inevitable for followers of Jesus Christ. It's something you can count on. We don't always get to avoid the lion. Sometimes we got to be thrown in the pit and face them. Daniel witnessed that before. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as I said, they had to go through the fire. And Daniel understood that when you stand in faith, sometimes you got to face the fire. Sometimes you got to face the lions. But Daniel also knew something else. And this is the second thing you can count on if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes, persecution and trouble are inevitable. But here's something else trust is essential. Trust is essential. Look at Daniel 6, 16 and 17. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. 
A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the, ring, uh, and the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Might not be changed. Daniel's situation looks bleak, doesn't it? The den where the lions were kept was more like a, 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 a pit. It was more of a pit. And, and, and in this pit, usually, uh, it, it was probably, they, they believe it was kind of, a, from what they see in archaeological ways, kind of a, a rectangle, kind of a, a pit. And down the center of it uh, was a barrier. And so the lions were usually in one area of the pit or the den. And then on the other side, that's where they would usually drop the food or drop the people. And, and they would have them on the other side. Then they would, they would lift up the middle and they'd put the, the stone over. They'd lift up the middle of it and the lions would have at it. That, that was kind of the way it was. Darius had tried everything. Remember that to free Daniel. He tried everything he could. He worked until sundown. He, he tried everything to no avail. But I love what Darius says at the end of verse 16. He says, may your God who you serve continually rescue you. You know what, you know what da Darius is really saying? I've done everything I can do, Daniel. I've tried it all. I've tried to figure this out. Everything in the natural, everything that I can do, I've tried to do it. But guess what, Daniel? It's in the Lord's hands now. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where everything you've tried humanly possible, all the things you've tried, everything you've tried, you tried to, to get out of a situation, you tried to fix a situation, you, you tried to, maybe you got a diagnosis and you went to this doctor and that doctor and you tried this medicine and that medicine and this and that. And it just came down to that no matter what it was, nothing seemed to be the answer. And it just kind of came down to, well, it's in the Lord's hands. It's in the Lord's hands now. Friends, I've got to tell you, that was the situation. It's, it's in the Lord's hands. Darius says, you know what? May the God you serve, the God continually that you serve, may he rescue you. Guess what? I've tried everything I can try, and I've come to the end of my rope. It's in the Lord's hands now. But friends, I've got to tell you, when it's in the Lord's hands, that's the best place to be. That's the best place to be when it's in the Lord's hands. Because trust for the believer is essential. It's essential for Darius, for him, he didn't know, you know, he's saying this, but it really isn't a faith, it's not really a, a, a trust or a, a faith statement. It's more of a throw up your hands, I've got nothing else to do, I hope God rescues you. How do I know that? Because Darius spends the night worrying. Daniel 6, 18, the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. He's clearly worried. Daniel, uh, Darius seemed to be up all night. You ever been worried about something up all night? If that's the case, then you haven't really put it in the Lord's hands. There are sometimes we come to the end and we say, well, it's in the Lord's hands. And then we spend all night worrying about it. And when we spend all night worrying about it, we haven't really put it in the Lord's hands. Darius hasn't put it in the Lord's hands, but it's going to contradict what happened with Daniel. Because while Daniel or while Darius was up all night worrying, Daniel was in the lion's den sleeping. Daniel was in the lion's den resting. He was resting. And it's interesting in this story because you have this story. And if this was a movie, I would, I would just like not like wh where it went. If this was a movie or, you know, you get to the climax, you know, they're out to trick Daniel. They're out to get him. The king is working all night and he's trying and he can't figure it out. And finally, they come to the end and they throw Daniel in the lion's den. Scene change. Now it goes to the king. Who's worried about the king? I'm not worried about the king. I want to know what happened to Daniel. But we get this scene where all of a sudden we got to flash over to the king. And the king being up all night and worried. King, what are you being? Why are we worried about the king? Because what we see here is God trying to contrast the worry of the king and the trust of Daniel. Daniel not being panicked. We don't hear... Daniel being panicked. We don't see Daniel begging for his life. We don't see Daniel fretting. No, what we see in verse 19, that at the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called to Daniel in anguish, in anguish voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion? See, Darius didn't know. Hey, could it be? Daniel, are you still alive? First light, I'm running. I'm getting there. I got to open it up. Daniel, are you there? Did God answer? Daniel, are you there? 
And Daniel, <laughs> Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel. He shut the mouths of the lions. They did not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done any wrong before you, your majesty. Never have I done anything wrong. Why? Why did we, why did we get to this place? Why, did, why are we in this place where the king is worried? But Daniel says, no, no, and then the king lived for I'm okay. The God sent an angel and shut the lion's mouths. I'm okay. Why is that? Well, let's take a look at verse 23 because at the end of it, it tells us why. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him. Look at this. Because he trusted in his God. Trust is essential. When you're a follower of Jesus Christ, trust is essential. I'm going to tell you, persecution and trouble are a part of this world. Sometimes you're going to go through the fire. Sometimes you're going to be in the pit facing the angry lions. Sometimes you're going to have to go through it. And friends, trust is essential. Faith in God is essential essential. Daniel trusted in the Lord. He didn't hope in Darius's ability to set him free. He knew that ultimately he was in the hands of God. And like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he knew that God had the power and could deliver. But even if he didn't, he was still going to be faithful. He was still going to be faithful. He was still going to be steadfast. In fact, steadfast is being faithful in extreme circumstances. That's steadfastness. The idea of steadfastness it evokes thoughts of strength and intensity. It's to grab hold and even clutch tightly to the very promises and character of God. William Barclay, a, a theologian, writes in various biblical commentaries, he said this, so often we have a kind of vague, wistful longing that the promises of Jesus should be true. The only way to enter into them is to believe in them with the clutching intensity of a drowning man. Friends, trust is essential. That's, that's where we have to be is trusting, believing, clutching with intensity of a drowning man to the very promises of God. How did Daniel develop this kind of trust and faith? It was developed in his time of prayer. One author put it this way. Daniel's bedroom was the real lion's den. That's where the battle was fought and won. By committing himself to prayer, he won the only battle that mattered. Friends, there's a, there's a world of angry lions. There's a world of angry lions there's one whose roar, who, who seeks to roar at us. There's a world of angry lions. You don't win the battle out in the world of angry lions or when you're in the circumstance. You win the battle in the bedroom. You win the battle in the prayer closet. You win the battle in prayer. That's when you learn how to develop an intimacy and a trust in God. That's where the battle is. Psalm 112 speaks of a man who fears the Lord. And in verse 7, it says this, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Friends, trust is essential. Trust is essential. It's critical to place our faith and our trust in Jesus. There was a, a Sunday school teacher. She once asked her class uh, why Daniel wasn't afraid when he was thrown in the lion's den. And, and I love what one little girl said. I mean, you know, faith of a child, right? One little girl said, because the lion of the tribe of Judah was in there with him. Friends, we can trust because the lion of the tribe of Judah is with us. The God we serve is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. You see, Daniel's faith cannot be discounted as a reason for deliverance because Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Mark 29, 23, Jesus said, all things are possible for him who believes. You believe that all things are possible. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, 33, the Hebrews chapter 11 is a faith chapter, right? And it gets to the end talking about people who are of faith all the way through. And it gets to this list. And in Hebrews eleven twenty three, 23, it says, who shut the mouths of lions. See, in God's eyes, faith and trust are critical. And Daniel 6, 23 tells us that Daniel believed in the Lord, his God. Daniel believed in the Lord, 
his God. What do you believe about God? And this leads us to the third truth that you can count on, and that is this, deliverance is possible. So persecution and trouble are inevitable. Trust is essential. And friends, we trust. Why? Because we believe that deliverance is possible. Daniel 6, 22, my God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done wrong before you, your majesty. Listen, I was rescued. I was delivered. Why? Because my God is able, because my God is more powerful, because my God is a deliverer. And deliverance is possible. Deliverance is possible. Dr. David Jeremiah in in his book, Agents of Babylon, points out that for Daniel and his three friends, faith was a commitment to omnipotence, not outcome. I love that. Faith was a a commitment to omnipotence, God's power, not the outcome. He, he, He says, as three friends said before, being thrown in the fiery furnace, God is able to save whether he chooses to or not. In either case, our trust is in him, whatever the outcome deems best. That's faith that surely pleases God. I love that. Friends, our faith is not in the outcome. Our faith is in the power of God. And we know that the power of God, that deliverance is possible. Paul Harvey once told a a story about a church in Betrice, Nebraska, the West Side Baptist Church. Every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m., they'd have choir practice. And uh, and they'd get together. It was at 7.30 p.m. sharp. In fact, they wanted to start on time. So everybody usually got there early or or on time at the latest at, at 7.30. Most people came before that. They were usually regularly there all the time, except on one particular day, On one particular day, everybody had an excuse as to why they were late. Uh, One of the the piano player took uh, an afternoon nap and happened to oversleep, and so she was late. One of the choir members was a student who was having trouble with his homework, lost track of time, and, uh, and he was late. Another couple who sang in the choir for some reason that day, their car wouldn't start, wouldn't start, wouldn't start, and, uh, and they were late. In fact, all 18 members did not show up to the church at 7.30, and it's a really good thing. Why? Because on that particular day, there was a gas leak in the basement, and at precisely 7.30 p.m., the gas leak ignited the furnace in the middle level of the church, and it blew up, and that, that furnace room was right below the choir loft was right below the choir loft. It decimated everything. It would have killed everybody. But guess what? Nobody was there. Why? Because we serve a God with deliverance is possible. Deliverance is possible. Deliverance is possible. I love it. Deliverance is possible. And you know what? Deliverance is possible. But deliverance doesn't always happen, does it? It doesn't always happen. Did Isaiah have faith in God? Yep, but he was sawn in two. Did Peter have faith in God? He was crucified upside down. How about the apostle Paul? Yeah, he he believed in God. And many times he experienced God's deliverance. Other times he experienced being ripped, being being whipped and being shipwrecked and and being stoned and, and all kinds of things. And then finally he had a Roman axe sever his head from his body, right? Deliverance is possible. Doesn't always happen, but deliverance is possible, but in the story, we can just picture from what we know of Daniel's integrity. Daniel gets down in the lion's den, and Daniel's thinking, you know what? This can either be a wonderful deliverance, or this could, this could be my la- you know, this could be the lion's meal. You know, I could be the lion's dinner. Like, either way, either way, but Lord, I'm trusting you either way. I'm trusting you because I know you have the power to deliver, and you can deliver either way. You can deliver either by delivering me from the lions and allowing me to continue, or you can deliver me into your presence. Either way, the answer is going to be the same because when Darius came and unlocked the pit and he said, Daniel, did your God deliver? Daniel's response was, may the king live forever. And the response could have been this, may the king Darius live forever, or it could have been an eternity, may the king God live forever. And Daniel said, either way, I win. Either way, I win. I know that is such a hard thing for us to process. We don't have a good theology of suffering. In the American church, the Western church, we don't have a good theology of suffering. We know that deliverance is possible and we want deliverance every time. But friends, sometimes deliverance doesn't happen. Sometimes the outcome is different, but we don't worship the God of the outcome. We worship the God of the possible. 
The God who is able to deliver. The God of omnipotence. The God who has the power. And we recognize that because he had the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. That as a believer in Jesus Christ, trust is essential. And when I put my hope and my trust in God, I do not need to fear what happens to me here. Either way I win. Either way I win. God has the power to deliver, but understand, as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, we will face persecution. We will face trials and troubles. They are inevitable. Temptations abound. As a follower of Jesus Christ, understand trust is essential, and we have a God who can be trusted God will right the wrongs and he has the power to deliver. And sometimes we might have to face the lions and sometimes we end up in the fire. But friends, know this, we are never alone. Never alone. Daniel cultivated his relationship with God and his trust in God through a regular habit of prayer. In prayer, that's where the battle was won, was in the prayer room. That's where the battle was won. That's where he had the strength to stand and the peace no matter what he faced, even when it seemed impossible odds. And throughout his life, Daniel had learned that God can be trusted, whether it was in Daniel chapter 1 when he said, you know what, I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to defile myself with the food from the king's table. And he watched how God gave him favor when he obeyed God. That was a little step of obedience. Or later on, when the king was about to put all the wise men to death, including Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they went to prayer and they said, you know what, our God, maybe he'll reveal the dream to us. Maybe he'll give us the dream and the interpretation. And they went to prayer and they went to fasting and they discovered that there was power in prayer and fasting and they saw how God had delivered them once again. Whether it was hearing the story of, of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his friends, and how God had, had allowed them to go through the fire and yet had his presence there with them. And they came out with the smell of smoke or singeing over and over again. Daniel had witnessed the faithfulness of God. Every king that came into power, every king that had died off, Daniel continued to see, you know what? I'm just going to be faithful and I'm going to trust God. Over and over and over again. It was a pattern in his life. Friends, is faithfulness a pattern in your life? Is faithfulness a pattern in your life? What have you seen God do in your life over and over again? I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And I want to just share one last story with you. I want to close. A story of a guy by the name of C.I. Schofield. You may uh, if you know anything about it, C.I. Schofield, he wrote a, a commentary later on, a reference Bible, Schofield Reference Bible. But Schofield's testimony is interesting. You see, he was, a, he was a lawyer before he had written these kinds of reference Bible and those kind of things. Before he had an experience where he put his faith in Christ, he was an alcoholic. He was a lawyer and he was an alcoholic and, and, uh, and, and until about the age of 36. And when he, when he came to know Christ, he went on to become a, a, a great pastor and evangelist and Bible teacher and missionary advocate. But once he gave his testimony based on the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And he said this, this is his own words. Shortly after I was saved, I passed by the window of a store in St. Louis where I saw a painting of Daniel in the lion's den. The great man of faith with his hands behind his back and the beasts circling him, looking up. And he said, as I stood there, great hope flooded my heart. You see, only a few days before, uh, only a few days, excuse me, had passed since I was a drunken lawyer who had been converted. And yet no one had told me about the keeping power of Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, the lions are all about me. They are too much for me, my old habits and my old sins. But he said this, but looking at that painting, the one who shut the mouths for uh, lion's mouths for Daniel can shut them for me. Friends, I want you to know that the one who shut the mouths of the lions for Daniel is able to shut the mouths of whatever it is you are facing. Whatever it is you are going through, whatever it is, whether it's old sins and old habits and addictions that continue to bark at you, whether it's a past that you can't seem to get over or guilt or shame that you can't seem to get past that just keeps barking at you. 
The enemy, the devil, is called an accuser of the brethren. And sometimes he just keeps accusing. Sometimes temptations come. Sometimes the lions come. Sometimes people are, are growling at you and barking at you. And the lions are coming. But let me tell you something. The same God who had the power to shut the mouths of the lions for Daniel has the power to shut the mouth of whatever is attacking you. You have to face it. Trust is essential. Is your faith in God? Do you believe that God is able to deliver you? Whatever it is, friends, it comes down to trust. The God you serve is powerful, is a powerful overcoming God. And he's able to help you face whatever the impossible, difficult, or bleak situation you are in. Deliverance is possible. God is powerful. But friends, trust is essential. Trust is essential. So I want to just ask us right now to bow our heads. If you're watching online, I want to ask you to pray with us. And maybe today your faith, you need to just put your faith in Jesus today. Maybe you haven't put your faith in Christ today. Maybe you're experiencing some things. You've come to the end of your rope like Darius trying everything he can and came to the end of his rope. Maybe today you're at the end of your rope. Maybe you're watching online and today you're at the end of your rope. But today you say, you know what? I know I can see it in this story with Daniel and I want to put my trust and my faith in Jesus today. Trust is inevitable. Maybe you're here today and you want to trust Jesus for the first time in your life. Or maybe you need to come back to the Lord, rededicate your life to Jesus. And you say, Pastor, I want to put my faith in Jesus today. Will you slip up your hand if that's you watching online? Will you just let us know? Will you just say, I need to put my faith in Jesus? Will you let us know in the comments? I need to put my faith in Jesus today. Hallelujah. Secondly, maybe you're here and you're going through some things. Maybe you trust in Jesus, but man, you're going through some things and you say, Pastor, I need prayer. My faith is waning in the midst of the situation and the circumstances in the pit and the fire, whatever it is. My faith is waning and today I just need a strengthening of my faith and I just need to continue just to re-say I'm, I'm trusting in you in the midst of it, Jesus. I'm trusting in you. Pastor, pray for me. If that's you, will you slip up your hand? If you're watching online, will you just say, pray for me? That's all you have to put. Pray for me. I'm in the fire. Pray for me. I'm in the lion. I'm facing the lions. Pray for me. Come on. Let's pray right now. Jesus, today we put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. We don't always understand why we go through the things that we go through. We don't understand why we have to face the things that we have to face. But today we declare that our trust and our hope is in you. Lord, if it's anybody's first time Jesus, we just put our hope in you. We ask you to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us today. We put our hope in you for salvation, for forgiveness, for grace. We put our hope in you. Lord, if there's others that are going through the fire, they, they have faith, but their faith is waning, I pray a strengthening of faith, trusting and knowing, God, that deliverance is possible, that you are omnipotent, that you are powerful. God be at work in lives today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, why don't we stand today? And if you put your faith in Jesus today, I want to invite you to do something for me. If you haven't downloaded our app, will you do that? And there's a place in there that has a decision card or at the bottom of the notes, if you were following along, there's a place there that you can just click and say, I, I made a decision to follow Jesus today. Whether you're in here, or whether you're watching online, will you just click that? Will you click that decision card or click that link? That'll take you to the same place. And let us know that you gave your life to Christ today. We want to follow up with you. We want to give you tools and be able to walk with you. Because it's not easy and you can't do it alone. And we want to come alongside you today.